Hey guys, in this video, we're going to be taking a look at uh, Sivalescu's piece, Genetic Interventions and the Ethics of Enhancement of Human Beings. So a little quick background. Uh, the big issue in this paper is whether or not it's okay or good or right to genetically enhance human beings. Um, in other words, are designer babies okay? So that's the, the basic idea. And we're seeing with genetic enhancement now, people Scientists can go into the genes and directly alter the genes using CRISPR technology. So um, this uh, this possibility is not that far off in the future. So is it okay to genetically enhance our kids to make them uh, smarter, to change their eye color, whatever? Um, now, in the literature, people make a distinction between enhancement and therapy. So what we're looking at is genetic intervention for the purposes of enhancing the child to above normal levels of capacity, like intelligence or whatever. Um, but there's also the, the issue of uh, enhancement for therapeutic reasons. So for example, genetically engineering um, a baby so that they don't have a gene for some disease, like Hodgkin's disease or something like that. Whether or not that's okay is less controversial. Most philosophers think, yes, it's okay to genetically engineer uh, to prevent disease. But the controversial issue is, is it okay to gene genetically engineer for enhancement purposes? So the aim of this paper is to offer three arguments in defense of genetic enhancement of human beings. And we'll take a look at those. Um, and then he offers some replies to objections against genetic enhancement. So let's take a look at what his understanding of enhancement is. So enhancement, according to Sebalescu, is helping people to live longer and better lives than normal. So we have a standard of normalcy and enhancement is moving beyond that standard. Um, and he's particularly concerned with genetic enhancement. So there's many different ways in which we can enhance our capacities, our biological capacities, like our ability to focus, our intelligence. You know, we drink coffee, you know, we meditate, you exercise, eat a healthy diet, all that kind of stuff can enhance. But he's particularly concerned with genetic enhancement and that's the controversial issue. So his first argument draws on a hypothetical case. And what he's trying to argue here is that choosing not to enhance your child, genetically enhance your child, is actually wrong. So this is the case of the lazy parents. So in this case, we have a child with normal intellect, um, but the parents could increase that child's intelligence by giving the child a cheap dietary supplement. So they could go to the store, buy this supplement for like a dollar a bottle, so it's no burden on the parents to get this supplement, give it to the child, thereby increasing the child's intelligence. But it just so happens the parents are very lazy and they choose not to do this. And so the child's intellect remains normal. So it's not below normal, it's just normal intellect. Now, the question Sevalesco raises here is, is it wrong for the parents not to give their child a supplement? And he argues that we should think it is wrong for the parents not to give that child the supplement because it's wrong for parents not to give their kids as much opportunity as they can as long as it's not at too much of a cost for the parents. So here it's not burdensome at all on the parents to give their child this supplement, which would increase the child's opportunities, raising his intelligence. And so the parents are, are, are doing something wrong in this case. Now that's debatable, but Sibelisku says that most people, that we should think that it's wrong for the parents not to give the child a supplement. So, if it's wrong to not give the child the supplement to increase his intelligence, then by the same line of reasoning, it would also be wrong not to genetically enhance the child's intellect, assuming that genetic enhancement is also not financially burdensome or burdensome in other ways. So, this is a parity of reasoning kind of argument. Second argument draws on consistency. And basically, it's the basic idea behind this argument is that we enhance our kids in all these acceptable good ways. Genetic enhancement is no different morally. Therefore, it's good to genetically enhance their kid, our kids. Um, so there's no moral difference between environmental interventions like supplementation, diet, giving piano lessons, hiring tutors, uh, whatever and genetic intervention, like using CRISPR technology. Environmental manipulation can cause biological changes, um, including neurological changes. So 
what you feed your child can change genetic expression. It can have a biological impact, obviously. And there's other factors that can change and alter the genes of a child that are environmental. So one example that Sivalescu raises is this study in which rats who had mothers versus rats who did not have mothers that were not mothered, they showed certain genetic changes. Um, so the mothered rats had certain genetic changes that were passed down to the next generation. And that's an environmental impact on genes. So the outcomes of indirect environmental in intervention and the outcomes of direct genetic intervention are the same, <clears throat> which is <clears throat> certain genetic alterations. So what he's trying to argue here is that there's no moral difference between these two kinds of intervention, environmental versus genetic. So there's nothing morally special about genetic manipulation that would make it wrong. If it's okay to um, change the environment, feed your child a certain way, give your child piano lessons, whatever, um, then it should also be okay to directly genetically engineer your child and alter the genes of your child because there's no moral difference. Both end up changing the genes. So that's the argument from consistency. Um, the third argument is he's trying to show that there's no moral difference between genetic enhancement and treating the disease. <clears throat> so here's the argument in step-by-step -step form. First, the purpose of treating the disease is to gain health. Well, what's so valuable about health? Health is valuable because it enables us to live well. Its purpose is to increase our well-being. So ultimately, the purpose of treating disease is to increase our well-being. Uh, genetic enhancement also enables us to live well. And I should say we're assuming that it's safe. Genetic enhancement is safe. So he's making that assumption. Um, since it's morally right to treat disease because it benefits people, that's the whole point, then it's also morally right to genetically enhance people to benefit them. It also has the same purpose or point. So here, what basically what he's saying is that treating disease has the same purpose as genetic enhancement. Because they share the same purpose, they're both, or because, um, um, treating disease has this purpose, and that's good, and because genetic enhancement has this purpose, then it must also be good. So, Sivalesco goes on to support that third premise, that genetic enhancement enables us to live well. Well, how exactly would it do this? And it does this by increasing opportunities for well-being. So, genetic enhancement increases opportunities for well-being. Um, and he goes on to talk about how well-being can consist in many different things. Um, this doesn't need to concern us too much here. Uh, well, how does it, how would it increase opportunities for well-being? So he goes on to talk about this. Um, he cites the um, uh, Walter Mitchell's impulse control experiment, which is also known as the marshmallow experiment. If you've taken a psychology class, you might have come across this. Uh, I'm not going to show the experiment here. I'll have a link to it in Canvas. Uh, this is a TED Talk. Uh, definitely check it out so you know what's going on in the experiment. It's also a very entertaining talk, so definitely check it out. But what this experiment shows is that our capacity to control our impulses, our capacity to delay gratification, is largely genetically based. And what they found is that our capacity to uh, restrain our impulses and to um, to restrain our impulses is correlated with how successful we are. So the better we're able to restrain our impulses and to delay our gratification, the more successful we will be, uh, generally speaking. Um, and by success, that's measured by you know how. Uh, the person's grades, um, IQ levels, uh, just general success later in life. Um, so what this shows is that there's a, a, a core sort of genetic uh, basis for 
how well we turn out later in life. Um, so parents and how they raise kids, they get to pass. <clears throat> okay, the upshot of the marshmallow experiment, just to reiterate, genetically engineering to aid in impulse control would benefit people. It would increase their chances of well-being. Um, it would increase opportunities. So that's the point of citing the marshmallow experiment. <clears throat> um, now, a question that's raised is, should people be genetically engineered to improve their moral characters? This is a bit of a different question that many philosophers, including civil has have worked on. Um, can we actually genetically engineer people to maybe be more empathetic or to uh, uh, be more motivated to, uh, to be beneficent or to help other people? Uh, some philosophers have argued that uh, given uh, how fast things are moving in the world today, and how explosive population is, um, we need to genetically enhance our moral characters and our moral motivations if we're not gonna, in order to prevent destroying our, the planet and destroying ourselves. Um, so that's a little bit of a separate issue, but interesting nevertheless. So now that he's looked at the arguments for genetic enhancement, he's gonna give, out, give his conception of how um, genetic enhancement should work, how it should be undertaken if we choose to undertake it. So he calls this a, a liberal conception of genetic enhancement. Um, he means liberal in more of the general sense, not in a partisan sense, political sense. Um, so the first point is that enhancement should not undermine liberty and should not be coerced. So you should be free to choose whether or not to enhance yourself or your, or your ch children. Uh, second point is safety. The intervention should be reasonably safe. Um, the, set, uh, the third point is that intervention should not result in harm, such as causing unfair competitive advantages. So what this would mean is that it should be distributed fairly. And so everyone should be given some opportunity to, to enhance. Um, and this ties into that fourth point here, distributed justice. So the intervention, genetic enhancement, should be, should be distributed according to principles of justice. So everyone should have equal opportunity to uh, genetically enhance. Um, this is actually going to address an objection against genetic enhancement, which is that it would result in a two-tiered hierarchical society. So fifth point, parents' choices of genetic enhancement should be based on a plausible conception of well-being. So for example, if, uh, if a parent thinks that living well means living constantly sick and so the, this parent genetically engineers their child to be constantly sick uh, that would be blocked by this um, point that's not a plausible conception of well-being also enhancement should be consistent with the development of the child's autonomy in a reasonable range of future plans so if you genetically engineer your child that would limit their autonomy and limit their options then that should not be permissible um, and it shouldn't even really be considered enhancement. For example, um, there's a debate about whether or not to genetically engineer children of deaf parents to be deaf so that they can participate fully in the deaf culture. Um, Civilesco would argue that this is not permissible because it would undermine the child's opportunities in life and so that would be blocked according to his liberal conception of enhancement. Okay, I'm going to try to go through this quick. Objection number one. So we're going to talk about some objections. Someone might say, uh, children are a gift from God or nature, and so we should not interfere with human nature by altering their genes. Well, his reply is that we interfere with nature all the time by treating illness, uh, screening embryos for diseases, treating lung cancer, so on and so forth. So modern medicine is interfering with nature all the time. Um, and these interventions are morally permissible or even obligatory even though they are interfering with human nature. So interference with human nature is not a reason to reject genetic enhancement. We do it all the time and it's a good thing. All right, I'm gonna pause here and the second video will take a look at the rest of these objections. All right, the second uh, objection has to do with uh, genetic discrimination. So the objection goes something like this. 
The practice of genetic enhancement would create a two-tier society of enhanced and unenhanced, uh, where the inferior, unenhanced, are discriminated against and disadvantaged all throughout life. Uh, this system obviously would be unjust. So you have this hierarchical system. There's some movies uh, that sort of use this as their premise. Um, but here's Sebulescu's reply. Um, there's a couple ways of replying to this. One way he replies is that, well, first of all, note that nature already distributes biological advantages and disadvantages in an unfair way. For example, some people are just born really smart. Other people aren't born really smart. So uh, the natural distribution of our capacities and uh, characteristics are is already unfair and we can actually use genetic enhancement to level the playing field uh, so uh, allowing enhancement could actually increase fairness um, but his second reply is that genetic enhancement could be constrained by laws that ensure fair distribution so there's nothing wrong with genetic enhancement in itself in this regard um, it doesn't have to discriminate we could uh, restrain it and control it in such a way that it would not discriminate or create a two-tiered society. So here's the third objection. Genetically engineering could uh, destroy the mystery of life. So genetic engineering, um, in some kind of way, it goes against human nature, um, or it would be an affront to human dignity. This is actually a, a an objection raised by philosopher Michael Sandel, in which he says that uh, genetic engineering would lend itself to this attitude in which we see our children as objects of our design and um, allowing genetic engineering would destroy the gifted character of life that are who we are is kind of a gift that's bestowed upon us by the universe by nature or by god if you're a theist and that's what's going on behind this objection and here's Sevalescu's reply he says well what actually makes us human is our capacity to make rational choices and to be autonomous. Autonomous, the ability to act on the basis of reasons and to self-govern. That's what makes us uniquely human. That's part of our human nature. And so enhancement is actually consistent with this nature. When we make choices, um, when we make choices about how we enhance our nature, we are exercising the very capacity that makes us human, our capacity to reason. Enhancement would also increase the number of opportunities to live a good life. And this is consistent as well with our autonomy. So genetic engineering is, is according to Sivalescu, uh, totally consistent with um, human nature and doesn't, does not go against human nature. It may actually enhance our human nature because it enhances our autonomy. Um, okay, so that does it for our talk on Sivalescu. There we go.